The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, mass market paperbacks party down with their ebook platonic forms and leave a metaphysical mess. Looks like they had fun, though. Plus, what doesn't kill Clan Corville makes it stronger and better looking, if that were possible. And we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. This time we have a great interview with Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. Sharon and Steve discuss their latest entry in the Leaden universe, Alliance of Equals. It's always fun talking with them about all things Clan Corville, so that's coming up. And we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. Now here's the news. The July mass market paperbacks are out, and we want to note that out this month is a special leather-bound edition of Flag in Exile, which is book five in the Honor Harrington series by David Weber. You may have noticed that we're reissuing the series in these cool leather-bound hardcovers, and now Honor has returned to Grayson to let things die down after she killed the nasty Pavel Young in a duel. Honor may want to nurse her wounds, but with war looming, Grayson needs someone to pull its navy into shape. And when you have Honor Harrington around to fix your broken navy, well, it would be a dang shame not to use her. And out in July is another book set in the Honorverse. This is A Call to Duty by David Weber and Timothy Zahn with a big assist from Thomas Pope, too, by the way. This is the start of the Manticore Ascendant series, set about 300 years before Honor, when Manticore was as much of a backwater as Grayson is during Honor's time, or maybe more so. This book introduces young Travis Long, a by-the-book young man who also unexpectedly thinks out of the box. He's a fun character to get to know. Also out is A Long Time Until Now by Michael Z. Williamson. This is Mike's time travel novel about a mixed group of American soldiers who are convoying through Afghanistan, and they get transported back to Paleolithic times and have to deal with life in the Stone Age, possibly stranded there forever. And then some very tough Romans show up to fight. I have to say this is maybe my favorite of Mike's books, and I'm a big fan of his work. It's well-researched, gritty, fun, and delivers a sense of science fiction wonder and a little creepiness near the end when we get more of a sense of what the time transport is all about. And out this month is the very book we are serializing here on the podcast. This is The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake, where Leary and Mundy must deal with a brush war in the backwaters of the galaxy that may have consequences for the rest of civilized space if it isn't contained. Plus, there's pirate treasure, possibly. Finally, we have the Cobra War Trilogy from Timothy Zahn. This is an omnibus collection of three novels by Timothy Zahn, which includes Cobra Alliance, Cobra Guardian, and Cobra Gamble. This covers the second war of the humanity with the Alien Troft, or an Alien Troft faction. We are going to talk more with Tim Zahn about this in an upcoming podcast soon, so watch for that. It's a banner month for Military SF and more. The Cobra War Trilogy by Timothy Zahn, Flag in Exile, Leatherbound Edition by David Weber, A Call to Duty by David Weber and Timothy Zahn, A Long Time Until Now by Michael Z. Williamson, and The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake are all now available at booksellers everywhere. I want to welcome Sharon Lee and Steve Miller to the podcast. Hello, folks. Hi, Tony. Hi, Tony. Sharon Lee and Steve Miller began co-authoring their tales of the Leaden universe 28 years ago. Is that, uh, I think I'm right there. Um, we, wrote, we wrote Agent of Change in 1984, and it was published in 1988. 
Okay. Let the listeners figure the <laughs> exact... It was a long time ago. The series went through a number of publishers until Bain Books saw a wonderful opportunity to reissue the series and to ask Sharon and Steve to write more novels, which they've done for the past decade plus with Bain. And uh, these include Fledgling, Saltation, Mouse and Dragon, Ghost Ship, Dragon Ship, Necessity's Child, Trade Secret, um, Dragon in Exile. Am I missing any? Besides the current one? I don't think so. I think you've got them all. Sharon and Steve are also the authors of other Bane novels, and Sharon's solo Archer Beach contemporary fantasy series includes novels Carousel Tides, Carousel Sun, and Carousel Seas. The original Leaden Universe novels have been collected into Bane omnibus editions as well, so you can get everything. Uh, there are three volumes of short stories and novellas set in the Leaden Universe, the Leaden Universe Constellation, Volumes 1, 2, and 3, with some wonderful stories in them. And now available at booksellers everywhere is the latest entry in the series, Alliance of Equals. Sharon and Steve, in Alliance of Equals, we are following the fortunes of Clan Corval once more, or Corval. Uh, they've been exiled or driven from the planet of Liad to the planet Sherbleek where they've set up house and become pretty successful. That's happened in the previous novel to, to this one. They're still at odds with the other Leaden clans, and their old inter enemy, the Department of Interior, is diminished, but still lurks about. Can you bring us up to speed on the immediate political situation Corville finds itself in? And Corville has been um, banished from its home world, Liad, for crimes against the planet, because they blew a planet trying to save the planet from a, from a really bad enemy, and they have relocated to the um, low-class Terran world of Sherblick, where they're trying to fit in. The political fashion <clears throat> on, on Sherblick itself is that things are still uncertain. Some of the people have welcomed them with open arms because uh, Miri, who is Valcon Yosfelium's life mate, and uh, so, Mary, being a local girl, they they're pretty happy to see her back and and being in in an in charge situation. Valcon's cousin, who is styled by all the people in Trubleek his brother, because they look so much alike, Patron is still in charge of Trubleek. So, on that regard, there's uh, a modicum of stability there. Throughout the rest of the their usual uh, stomping grounds, things are not quite so easy there. Politically, there are people who are dropping dropping them right and left, and uh, that figures into their trade situation and stuff like that as well. So uh, they're in a state of flux. Indeed, yes, as is the planet of Sherbrooke, which really doesn't have a political situation. It was sort of um, run by little territorial bosses and some people don't like the stability that the Leadens are bringing, and some people love it. Yeah, it, it was when Patron arrived, it might be equivalent of Mogadishu almost <laughs> in its um, uh, political shenanigans. Yeah. Well, they've come a long way since then, and we followed them in some in some great tales um, as well. What is um, what is a as a Liad clan exactly? Can you just explain that again to? Extended family. Most Leaden clans have at least two, sometimes three or four, quote unquote, family lines, different different last names, if you will. And it's a kin group that works together as an economic unit. Genetically, they are not necessarily all of, of the same uh, the same genes, and it's possible to. Uh, it doesn't necessarily happen. You can sometimes get married into a clan. Uh, it, but because the structure of relationships in, includes contract marriages, part of the political situation that got disrupted when Corval was thrown off the world, uh, since it does include short-term marriages automatically, uh, the, the structure tends to have a longer, not not entirely genetic, but hi, a historic uh, background to it. And Corval is particularly concerned with trade, right? Not all of the clans are. No, Corval is actually um, 
somewhat unique in being a trade clan. Um, most Liadans like to stick to Liad and other Liadans. They're, they're a slightly uh, xenophobic civilization. They don't really like Terrans or going out and learning new stuff. Now, the Liadan universe is not our universe. Um, certain things work there, um, like there's psionics there, or mind reading. Uh, well, it's not mind reading exactly. Yet there are Terran traders. Their people um, are generally humanoid, except for, of course, of course, the very cool clutch turtles. Tell us about the bigger picture, the cosmic background of the Liadan universe, if you can. Well, the Liadan universe is for the uh, for the Terrans and for the Liadans themselves a secondary universe. They originated in a in a universe where there were uh, again slightly different uh, abilities available to people and to to creatures, and they have uh, escaped at a cusp of that universe where the the people with the creatures they had become by then who had a lot of mind power had decided that they wanted to get rid of the all these ugly life forms that were messing Mess, things up messy life forms, yes. uh -huh. and uh, began moving in, in a way to in effect to crystallize the universe into a way that it would become permanent and uh, entirely under their mental domination so these people the terrans and the uh, liadans to the extrang as well were all escapees. There are some people, uh, you mentioned the clutch total, turtles, uh, who are, I guess, endemic, no, who, <laughs> who are native to <laughs> native, the universe, <laughs> to, the, uh, uh, to the current universe. And so the Terrans and, and the Liadans are slowly filling the galaxy that they've arrived in, but it was not their, it was not their original Galaxy, the universe, and the the uh, in in fact one of the telling points in the new universe is that Pi works in the the universe they're in, and in the universe they came from, it was a steady state universe, and there was no there was no three point one four etc. Uh, as a um, which is a result of the expansion of the universe. So you said Pi works. Yeah, yeah, PI. Oh, okay. And and, and that's just th that's like a uh, a universal constant that changes things in many ways. Is that the yeah. one? Of, one of the cool things I'm going to give something away at the very very end of um, Crystal Dragon when when the um, people are trying to escape the old universe and escape the the enemy that is pursuing them. Um, guy who has come up with the codes that will allow them, he thinks, to leap into a new place says, hold on a minute, and says, add this to your piloting equation, and he reels off a number. And she, the, our pilot, our hero, adds it to the piloting equation, and that allows him to come to this, to this universe. I think it took, I think it took us two or three years before we got this first letter from a reader who said, wait, that's pi! <laughs> <laughs> so you guys put, you, rather like Easter eggs or, or things in that, that, are there still things, um, that readers might discover? On March 1st. And, uh, of course, not everybody is reading at the same rate or from the same direction. So, yeah, there are... Oh, yeah. Uh, there, are there are people who are, uh, who are fans of old science fiction who periodically will come up to one or another of a convention and clap us on the shoulder and say, hey, 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 I saw what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> and it might be the name of a, a, of a location, it might be the name of a gun, it might be a, a particular happenstance that refers to anything from uh, from Doc Smith to Zelazny to uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary. Or, yeah, or, we or, have range, wide-ranging interests. Yeah. Um. Well, that's one of the delights of, uh, of just having this giant tapestry of a series to, to read. So the technological situation really comes into play in Alliance of Equals, um, particularly concerning artificial intelligences. We've met a couple in previous books, including that great character Jeeves and the um, starship Bechamo, or Bechamo. One of the threads of Alliance of Equal has to do with an AI called Admiral Bunter. Can you explain how AI works in your world and some of the dangers posed by entities such as the Liar Institute, who, who are some of our bad guys? 
explain how AI works? Well, uh, in in terms of <clears throat> pardon me, in the, in the terms of Admiral Bunter, uh, Admiral Bunter was an accidental. Uh, was, Ad or is Theo's fault? Yeah, yeah. It was an a an accidental uh, construction uh, designed to, in in effect, to coordinate a bunch of of old ships and allow them to function as a uh, as a unit in an emergency situation. The follow-on to that was that there was, besides being able to control that bunch of ships as that bunch of ships became sentient, as, as sort of as a, as a unit, uh, that comes, the, the overview in the story comes from the idea that there, there are units that, uh, units, uh, computing units that can become sentient. They can have their their own awareness, not simply an awareness based on uh, look around and follow this program, but look around, follow this program, and holy, I better do something else. And so they're, they become self-aware and, and, in fact, people. And it's not even accidental as, as it comes out in when we meet Bishimo, well, and even when we meet, meet Jeeves way back, um, <clears throat> that they were constructed to be people. They were constructed so that they would, in fact, be sentient when they were awakened. The problem what? is, um, and it's addressed in Alliance of Equals, is just because you're a um, sentient spaceship doesn't mean you have social skills. Yeah. But, but why, um, I mean, this, this is very important because this creates the need for mentors, right? That's, that's exactly right. You, you're alive, you're intelligent, and you don't know where to start. So a mentor will come in, um, a human mentor will come in, and he will teach you um, social skills, he will teach you ethics, he or she um, will give you um, programs to access first, he will give you things like laws, like for instance the, um, oh, the, the advanced logic laws, yeah. which um, basically mean that if you're a um, artificial intelligence, you best hide because there's a bounty on your um, computer. Why? Um, Why is there a bounty on artificial intelligences? What's led to this? There was a war a long time ago. Jeeves was in the war. Um, and a, such, such a vast war and, and so difficult in human terms. The only way to win the war was to build intelligent battleships. Um, so the side that won did that. Um, but then they realized that they had built machines that could kill humans. So clearly that could not be allowed to stand. Um, so that's where the wall comes from. Um, the fact in the short form, we haven't written all of that yet. Mm -hmm. But there are, um, it's, but the there are people that are out to um, to either control or to use as tools the artificial intelligences, and there's people that want to just just shut them down, right? Right. The scouts, the scouts, the lead and scouts are usually the good guys, or among the people who think that AI is really bad. Well, there's just, I mean, there's so much background here. We also have a young woman who may be awakening to powers and and perils of, of a kind of mental ability. She's a Dromlisa. We have two Dromlisa, I don't know if I'm saying this right, who may be resurrected by the ancient Terran clone named uh, Uncle as well in the story. What does it mean to be a Dromlisa? What, is, what does that kind of person do in this world? Some people are only healers. They can um, they can reach in and help you deal with your emotions and lose a fear. Or some of them can reach can reach over to you after you've picked up a uh, cast iron uh, pan off of a stove that's been heated, and they can reach over to you and soothe your skin and and allow you to actually be healed physically. So there's a psychic healing that can go on. And a physical healing. So the Dromleys are, in effect, magicians, or if you want to take it further, they're uh, telekinesis, teleportation. Yeah, they, yeah. They, have, they have these. They have the ability to to reach into a a slightly different dimension almost, and and to make things happen. This is this is actually an, an old this is an idea from old science fiction where you had the psionics, um, the people who could. Um, Read minds, guess cards, um, alter, telekinesis, telekinesis um, precog. They could look a little way into the future and, and 
find out what was going to happen, maybe. Um, back when we started writing, the Ryan Institute was still doing its, its experiments with, um, with people who were supposedly psychics, guess a full of cards. Uh, so that was still in the, in the realm of quote-unquote science. Yeah, analog and uh, Mr. Campbell at Analog had, had been a big uh, adherent of the idea that there were mind problems. Powers Mind that powers. could be uh, that could be uh, utilized, and in fact, there were apparently entire segments of the intelligence community in in this country and in Russia trying to learn to how to influence people at a distance and how by you know without mind a gun control, yes. by mind control and you know and trying to read things documents in locked drawers and stuff. So it had when we both started reading, and still when we were beginning to write, the idea that uh, these these kinds of powers might exist was, uh, if, if not prevalent, it was not unusual in the science fiction field. Yeah. I mean, it has a, a long heritage, like you say, in science fiction, with especially with, with uh, Campbell. You know, we find it in every, <laughs> we find it in Asimov, for instance, a lot. So... Um, but the the great thing about the Lian Universe novels is the characters and the stories they're part of. I mean, that's the main great thing. Um, of the main characters in Alliance of Equal is one of the main characters in Alliance of Equals is uh, Patty Yosgalen. She is the daughter of Sean Yosgalen. Um, I think they have the same last name, right? Yes, they do. Yes, and she's apprenticing aboard the Corval trading ship Beautiful Passage. Um, Tell us a little, Abby, she's apprenticing sort of in a dual state. Can you just tell us a little bit about Patty and who she is and the state of mind we find her in as the book begins? Well, Patty is Sean's heir, which is to say Sean is the master trader for Clan Corbeau at this moment, and Patty will be the master trader for Clan Corbeau in, in her turn. That's how the clans work. Um, and... She really wants to be a trader. That's what she wants to be. She wants to be a trader and a pilot of Corval, and that's it. And she is not really interested. Her father is a healer. She's not really interested in any of, of the healing or the Jam Lee stuff. She wants to just be a trader and a pilot, and she's studying really hard. Unfortunately, her studies were interrupted untimely when Clan Corval clashed um, head to head with the Department of the Interior, and the children and the elders were sent to a safe place. And the children were taught what they needed to do in case the enemy found them, which were terrible things. So Patty has learned how to fight and kill people, and she's um, barely sixteen. And and she has she she had a job um, within this uh, within the. Um, asteroid that they were all all on and part of her her job would have been to make sure that the if the enemy was breaking through to if she if they couldn't escape she was to be able to make sure that nobody escaped no one was taken captive uh, so not only does she have um is she desperately trying to catch up with her lost uh year she's she's got this um this baggage right yeah so what um as we began, she's taking part in some martial arts, um, and uh, the the instructor Steiner, I think, uh, is um, a little concerned about how intense she is. Can you tell us a little bit about the the martial arts here, um, and the dance arts, and how they intertwine, and uh, what is Patty's state of mind? Well, in in uh, in the real world that we all know and love today, <clears throat> there are many many martial arts and. Uh, some of the martial arts are striking arts that you know you learn to you learn to box, you learn to kick box. Then you have your 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 mass murder arts. I'm sorry, your your, <laughs> your mixed martial arts where the idea is to um, use whatever is available, and if you've got it on you, you can you can use it against somebody in effect. So what what we begin is by showing Patty learning. The, the basic dancing, which would be a sort of a uh, kung fu tai chi type of a of a of a thing, uh, you where you learn a certain amount of body control. 
that's Menfriat, and that that's uh, actually it's probably closer to uh, uh, Kung Fu and the uh, the Korean and and Brazilian arts uh, that we have around today. And what happens is that she she does everything at that state of I've got to kill somebody. I've got to kill somebody. I've got to get out of here. Yeah, she does everything at the state of this is a matter of life and death. One one of the people that I met in my checkered career was was an instructor of martial arts, um, and his um, protocol for if somebody was trying to hurt you was first run away. If you cannot run away, then try to tangle your you know d delay the person who's trying to hurt you so you can run away and if you can't do that only then kill them um and and, and patty, patty has kind of skipped the first two steps and going right to the third yeah step. her reaction is is if there's a problem what you do is you kill the problem and then then, and then you, you run escape away. and 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 that's that's her her approach to things so so of course her her martial arts instructor wants her to to take the smaller dances, the quiet dances, the ones that are much more like the uh, like tai, a tai chi, tai chi or yoga, and um, to Med so that she works out a meditative kind of a dance. One of the things they they explain on uh, debriot, which is the small dance, menpriot being the, the large dance. Um, the small dance gives you time to think, and it allows you to internalize what it is you want to accomplish here. Rather than as the Menfriat does, it's very often. So somebody has grabbed you by the arm. What do you do? You do now, and that's a reactive thing. And the Menfriat, get the the Ibrit gives you a chance to to instead uh, introspect. And um, it, it's a they should go together, and ideally. But of course, you can't learn it all at the same time. So the process is usually the Menfriat and then the other. Yeah, are... your children to. To kill enemies, you teach them to kill enemies. There's a really cool scene um, when Patty is uh, sort of forced into doing the the, the more calm uh, of the two martial arts, and um, she realizes that her instructor, her big bad instructor from the other ones in the class and as a student, you know, telling telling us at least, maybe not Patty, that um, this is uh, this is just as important as the other, right? And and she gets to call her inst her instructor by his first name, which I thought was funny, because she didn't really like to do that. Well, you know, I, I'm going to tell you that that in a way comes from our background in academia. I uh, uh, I I was a <clears throat> I taught science fiction at the University of Maryland, and I was uh, I was an undergraduate when I was doing it. I was part of a uh, a situation where they needed somebody to teach science fiction. I knew it, and one of my instructors came to me. One of my uh, one of my professors came to me and said, "Steve, I'm supposed to be teaching this class, and I'd be damned if I know enough about it to do it. Why don't you teach the class?" Mm -hmm. And um, and so then I got to call got to call him Wally. Before that, he was Doctor Shug. And it, it became a very strange bit of Malanti play for me because I would be walking down the hall while I was during this class, these kinds of class sessions, and my department head was Phil, and not not Dr. Lasher or whatever, and and so I had this whole whole range of of things, and I when I went back to later on, I went back to trying to teach it uh, to do. Um, some stuff at high school where I was teaching poetry and things, uh, it was very difficult for me to say to everybody, okay, call me Mr. Miller or call me Professor Miller, which I had been called by my students while I was still a student. So it was a very, uh, you know, it's a Malanti situation. And so um, we, we just sort of brought that stuff into the into the story. Yeah. So, all right, you you brought up the word Malanti, and I realize we it's in, it's central to a lot of a lot of these stories. Can you explain what that is? <laughs> um, Malanti is the number of hats one particular person wears, and knowing when to wear which hat. So, 
if you are if you are a writer, a mother, and a secretary, those are three different hats. Um, you have to decide when you're talking as a writer, when you're talking as a mother, and when you're talking as a secretary. And there are different languages and different postures and different necessities to all three of them. And it becomes more desperate than that. Um, one of the examples we used uh, is something that's happened locally, is that there was a woman driving a school bus full of kids. An accident happened in front of the school bus. She was, she was, an EMT. She was also an EMT. Now, her responsibility as a driver of the school bus is to stay on that school bus, not get off of the school bus, to protect those children as much as, as, much as possible. As an EMT, there's somebody out there who is going to die of blood loss. So that's a Malanti kind of a situation, a match where she's got to decide which of those hats she's going to wear. And she decided that she would save somebody's life and was immediately fired by the school board. Right, and that's the other part of Melanti. You know what you're choosing and what the what the results will be. Um, and if you choose what this woman did was she had the oldest kids come and stand guard for the youngest kids while she left the bus. Um, she called her supervisor for the bus, she called the local ambulance, and she went down to help the person in the wreck. Knowing she would lose her job. Mm. A difficult choice. Um, and the kind of choice you always put characters in, <laughs> in your books as well. Um, in another thread of the tale in Alliance of Equals, uh, we have a trio of characters attempting to save the young AI, um, who we've talked about, Admiral Bunter. Uh, this is Hazenthal, um, Toko Lauren, and Tali Jones. Uh, this is kind of literally the the Alliance of Equals. In fact, I think you call them the Alliance of Equals uh, at some point. Who are these three? How did they come together, and how did they work together? And what's so important about them working together? Awesome Fool is an ex ex strang ex or the ex strang are the people who are trying to eradicate everybody except ex strang. Um, and she is for reasons. Um, born to Clan Corval. Um, when Clan Corval came to Shorebleak, Hossenthal needed employment, and so she went down to, port, to the port and she signed up to be a port security guard, and she was partnered with Tolly Jones. So they were a working team of port policemen. And Tolly Jones is a Terran, um, or an apparent Terran, oh, an apparent of, Terran. of, um, of mixed background, and Shorebleak is exactly the kind of place where uh, adventurers go. Adventurers in the old sense of everybody says, let's go see what we can do. And, you know, so in a gold rush, you end up with uh, people who go and some of them end up starting laundries and some make, are bakers and some get hit over the head and robbed. And some make uh, blue jeans, and, you know. And so Tolly Jones is a man who happens to be decent with a gun, knows his background in a lot of different stuff, and he and Hasenthal as a team uh, he, he's aware, very aware of body language and stuff. Meanwhile, she looks really tough. And you don't mess with an ex drang and people know that, so they make an excellent team. Uh, Toko has come into the scene uh, because Toko is a pilot. And without giving too many of the, the fine points away, she, she's a pilot of a particularly odd extraction, uh, her father being an AI. And... Uh, so as, as a unit, if they're going to go off and deal with an AI who is too young and, uh, and possibly troublesome, Tully Jones, among his other things, he's secretly a mentor. So we have a mentor, uh, a guard, and a... Um, and another AI. And so it, they, they, have, they have formed uh, inadvertently and not on purpose, they have become a quest team in effect. Well, um, now, Tali, I don't want to give too much away, but he's also, um, Tali's the one that features in our uh, story, Wise Child at Bain.com, in his early days. Is that right? Well, earlier than Alliance of Equals. Yeah. People keep asking me how old, was and how old Tali was and when did this happen, and I don't know. Um, <laughs> we, we haven't, we, we don't haven't have his, there yet. Yeah, we don't have his calendar on, his calendar on us yet. Well, I wanted to mention there's a great, great story up at Bain.com right now. It's free to read, and we'll uh, get you into this universe. 
if you're listening, which is Wise Child, and it's set um, it's set in the in the past of of Alliance of Equals, and it's it concerns the, the Liar Institute, who are one of the set of several bad guys. Can you tell us a little bit about what they're up to? I know that you don't want to reveal too much. Um, the Liar Institute. Um, the Liar Institute started in the old galaxy when it was called the Tinger Liar Institute. Um, and what the Tinger, the old universe was, was very um, kind of um, free market about creating people and clones and breeding humans and breeding specialized humans. Um, and the Tinger Liar Institute bred humans who were um, really smart, really quick, who could be industrial spies, who could be assassins, who could do almost anything. Um, and when they came through in the list, they regrouped as the Liar Institute, doing basically the same stuff. Um, and one of the things they're very, very interested in is artificial intelligence, um, because it would give them much greater scope than they presently have, even with their, their numbers of students who are... Um, so adept at getting them information and things. So Tully is a is a product, is a student of the Wire Institute, and he has managed to um, liberate himself. And they're looking for him because he's really valuable. That's how he got to be a mentor. Right. He was raised to be well, raised to be a mentor, trained to be a mentor. Um. And in in his yeah, in his capacity of mentor. He realized that he was he was the uh, the ethical basis for people, and he looked very carefully at his own ethics and and came to a sort of a, a I, sh I can't use that phrase, <laughs> uh, but he he came to the understanding that hey I shouldn't be teaching these people this if I don't believe it I do believe it that means I gotta go. Um, he, he basically. Um Call the gap between cup and lip, um, and realized that he had to be someone who was worthy of his of his students, the people the people he was bringing to consciousness and training. Yeah. Well, he didn't want to be a tool of these jerks at the Liar Institute, right? That too. <laughs> yeah. He's a really cool character and very very winning. Um, as you as you write him, um, the, the Department of the Interior. Um, it's I, I've always loved that uh, that as the bad guys in uh, in the books is still out to destroy Corval. Uh, Patty and Sean get caught up in this. What's the department trying to do? And and what are these ships that are menacing Corval traders? What is Corval going to do about it? Oh well, <laughs> that's, that's the question, isn't it? Um, Var various various things are going on. One is that. <clears throat> The, uh, the department is no longer a cohesive thing. Yeah, the, the department itself is uh, has been fairly well shredded. Uh, they 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 are a number of arms of the department which have found themselves in a way uh, in the situation that Patron had been in, while Plan B had been in effect, is that they have they have come to believe that they are the the rest of the the rest of the stuff uh, the rest of the people and they must each one each of these groups must must act as if they are individually or as a as that small group uh, are the remains and they must bring balance upon Corval they must uh, they must survive they must do follow various tenets that they, that they hold so the uh, problem for for them is trying to attach uh, or either attach or destroy someone from Corval to get inside the get inside if they can. This is why they go after Bishimo and and uh, the Corval relative uh, who who is Bishimo's captain and at the same time if they can actually destroy a Corval ship as far as they're concerned they're up. And if they can actually capture or kill one of one of Corval's very few clan members, they're off. Because Corval has less than 20 members of the quite small and can barely protect itself. 
So what are some of the obstacles now that Corval still has to overcome if it's to prevent itself from being wiped out? I mean, they're not well liked by the other Lien clans at the moment. Um, and they, they're at Sherbleek. I've kind of come to like Sherbleek. I hope they're not going to abandon the place. Are they? Are... Or there, there are a number of things going on. One is that uh, Liad um, is described monolithically. If you say they don't, the, the clans don't like Corval. That's not true. There, there have always been allies of Corval, and there have always been, been enemies of Corval. Uh, a number of the clans of of Liad have also left or are, are in the process of leaving. They just haven't been thrown off yet. Uh, they're 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 able to do it voluntarily uh, because. Liad has, is, is looking so far inward and, and has become so stultified. So the clans of Liad are not uh, are, are not a, a unitary um, a, a unitary uh, society in in that way. Um, and that's actually part of what is um, troubling Shurblik because they have all these foreigners coming in. People have followed Kurval. Some of the healers have followed Kurval. Some of the scouts have followed Kurval. Whole clans have come, have decided that no, they're going to follow the dragon. And so they've come to Shurblik. Um So Shurblik is feeling a little overwhelmed at this particular moment. There's going to be some really difficult social adjustments. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you was the um, was the whistle question that I didn't get to when we were talking about Wise Child. Um, we we put up the penultimate version of the story by accident, and um, you, Sharon, were not so um, you you recognized that something was missing. What was so important about that dang whistle that <laughs> we needed to get that right? You have to understand that our readers read very very closely. We have been called on points of code. And if, and if anybody has a copy of the Leiden Code of Proper Conduct, I would like to talk to them because I want to buy it from them. Um, <laughs> but anyhow, they, they do read very closely. And in Dragon, of, Dragon in Exile, Tully is um, confronted with one of his directors, one of the people who's trying to get him back, and she has an instrument. She has a little clay pipe, and she blows it, and um, it kind of puts him into a trance. Um, to have them not have at least the threat of that whistle in Wise Child, someone would have noticed it and written to us and said, what happened to the whistle? Is that a new thing? Or, um, why didn't they use the whistle? Whatever. Use, yeah. we, we, would, we would have found, we had realized, and it was something that we had, uh, because of the story process that we, uh, or story you're gonna, confusion you're call that, it we, process, are you? that, right. that we use where we, Part of what we do is we'll sit down and one of us is lead on a story and we'll sit down and write it, be writing it, and bring it back to the table at, uh, after dinner and we have a very late dinner and we, we trade what we've been writing today. And the discussion is, oh, yeah, we got to remember to get the, story, the whistle in about here or maybe over here. And back and forth, we each said to the other at one point or two points, the whistle's got to go in. Oh, it'll probably go in here. Okay, I'll get it in when I go, go in to put it in for the second draft. Um, well, I didn't get it into the second draft. Sharon went back over, didn't see that it was wasn't in because there were some some points that were that were close that were still under under discussion. And then one night we said, "Oh, I think we're done." And we sent it to you. And then I did my last pass, what a couple of weeks before it was supposed to go live, and went, "Oh, damn, the whistle." Um, and so she then sent you the corrected pass, and that one got, got, got misfiled. Cross filed somehow. Yeah, because I was. Dang it, I was sure that we were using that, but we weren't. <laughs> but we got it fixed. It's correct and up online, right? It's correct, and thank you very much. We do appreciate it. Hey. We, and you do, because otherwise probably the fans would have asked you about the whistle, right. too. We didn't want people storming Bain, Bain editorial. So. So, um, so what's next? Where are we going with the Leiden universe? Um, will we continue in this vein? I know you guys jump around sometimes. Well, we were going to continue in this vein, but um, <laughs> Theo, Theo Waitley, who is um, the character who starts in fledgling and she goes through saltation and ghost ship and dragon ship, um, does not play well with others. She was supposed to share a book with, with what, what else was doing on... Um, on the dutiful passage, um, and that worked out not to be, not to be viable. So the Gathering Edge, which we turned in about a month ago, 
um, is a Theo book. It is the sequel to Dragonship. Um, and it follows the doings of Theo um, along about the same time as the, some of the events in Dragon and XO and some of the events in Alliance of Equals. So we're, we're kind of doing a 360 degree story here with pieces, pieces distributed in different books. Um, the book we're writing right now is um, creatively titled um, Book the Next, um, <laughs> and it is following Sherbleek and the AIs and the uncle. I think that's it. That's those three. And Theo, Theo is in this book, but she is not a, as far as I'm concerned, she cannot have a speaking part. <laughs> <laughs> So Theo tends to take things over, huh? Yeah. Oh no, she's awful. She's worse than Doc. Uh, she she's her father's daughter. Yes, yeah. she's. At one point, I was writing a book. What way back we were writing a book, and um, Dov, it was not Dov's book, and he kept trying to take it over, and I killed him. I killed him, and I was talking to a friend of mine on the phone that night, and she said, "So, how, what was you writing about? What were we writing today?" And I said, "Well, I killed Dov," and she said, "You cannot kill Dov. Go back and make him live." <laughs> well, uh, I don't know. I haven't read The Gathering Place quite yet, but um, I hope that uh, Patty and, and Theo, um, it, that seems like an irresistible force meeting an immovable object kind of meeting. I hope that happens. Uh, I mean, I know they know each other. I think they have met before, but uh, Patty with her uh, with her dawning consciousness of who she is. The thing is, is that we are going to be in places uh, coming up. We have a small book tour here in New England in the Northeast, and then we're going to be at Worldcon, and uh, we will be guests of honor at Confluence next year, not this year. We're going to be guests. Of, uh, we'll be guests of honor at MarsCon. So, if you want to come out, if people want to come out and talk to us in person. Uh, we'll probably be at Boscone. Uh, we usually are. So we, we've got some places where, for the people who would like to come out and meet us and ask us the questions. We also will be very shortly putting up an experimental uh, thing on our Splinter Universe page where we'll, where we'll be uh, telling people how to say certain words, like Melanti and things like that. So People always ask us that. Where can we find that? www.splinteruniverse.com. Splinter Universe. Is the is Corval.com still the main uh, Leiden Universe uh, gathering spot? Yes, that is. That's the spot where you will find the um, Leiden in, the Leiden info dumps and also news of new books and things and tours. The book that's out now is Alliance of Equals by Sharon Lee and Steve Miller. It's at booksellers everywhere. Sharon and Steve, thank you so much for being with us one, once again. Thank you, thank Tony. You. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend, the cyberspy Adele Mundy. The only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Coursera and bringing their charge home, maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. What is Arno asking from you? She brought her data unit live and began searching, starting with the sailing directions for Pantelleria, published by Navy House. Whatever the specifics of the problem were, the more she knew about Pantelleria, the better off she would be. The Treaty of Amiens required that the parties, the Republic of Cinnabar and the Alliance of Free Stars, 
Give up all territories captured during the course of the war, Deirdre said. There were balanced exceptions, but Pantelleria regained the independence it had lost 18 years earlier. Yes, said Adele to show that she was listening. Of course. But it was a polite acknowledgement, and she had been raised to be courteous when that was possible. Pantelleria had six colony worlds, all of which were controlled by the Alliance during the war and which were returned to Pantelleria under the treaty, Deirdre said. One of them, Corsera, declared its independence from the home world. Adele refined her search while she listened. Deirdre continued. A number of Pantellarians who were closely associated with the Alliance regime fled to Corsera. The exiles control a great deal of wealth, even after their assets on Pantellaria have been expropriated. They've been helping to arm the rebels, the independence movement, if you prefer. In addition, the former Alliance garrison on Corsera was locally recruited and remained on the planet. Adele continued to read her holographic display. Corsera held vast quantities of copper. The mining income was sufficient to sustain the rebellion indefinitely, unless Pantelleria was able to sustain a real blockade. That last seemed doubtful when the home world itself was disrupted by both the war and its recent change of government. Ah, said Adele. She looked past the hologram to Deirdre and quoted, The Pantellarian Council has appointed Herman Arnaud as Commissioner Plenipotentiary of Coursera, with full authority to return it to the beneficent control of the home world. I would say that Master Arnaud has chosen a difficult task. I am confident that he would agree with you, Deirdre said dryly. It affects me because whatever Arnaud's original expectation, he is now pinning his hopes on Cinnabar intervention as a signatory of the Treaty of Amiens, returning Corsera to Pantelleria as part of the status quo anti-provisions. Our legal department informs me that Arnaud's interpretation of the treaty language is open to question. Adele flicked her hand. It doesn't matter what lawyers say, she snapped. If we send troops, or ships more likely, the Alliance will certainly respond by supporting the pro-Alliance exiles. We'll be back in a state of full-scale war in six months, or more likely three. Yes, said Deirdre. My research bureau said within a year, but I accept your assessment. Renewed war would be even worse for my interests than being accused of supporting the Alliance during the recent war. So I have decided not to comply with Arnaud's request, morality aside, of course. Of course, Adele said. She pursed her lips. Partly to give herself more time to analyze the options, she said, Could you have gotten Cinnabar support for the Pantellarians? Deirdre spread her fingers before her. She had chunky hands. Indeed, she might best be described as a chunky woman. She was no more a raving beauty than her brother was a conventionally handsome man. Not that Deirdre's looks mattered. From what Daniel said, she preferred professional companionship to amateurs. Professionals cost only money, which she had in abundance. There are a number of hardliners in the Senate who believe we should not have made peace with a tyrant Pora, as they call him, Deirdre said, smiling faintly. Senators who feel that guarantor Pora's behavior toward his citizens is a proper matter of concern for the Senate of the Republic of Cinnabar, and also, Deirdre turned her palms up. There are hardline or personally involved alliance citizens who certainly are funneling arms to the rebels. Of course, the galaxy's awash with surplus arms following the general demobilization after the treaty. Adele nodded agreement. Arms dealers were rarely concerned with the political complexion of potential buyers so long as they could pay in hard currency. A campaign in the streets of Xenos protesting alliance aggression wouldn't be very expensive, Deirdre said combined with discussions with individual senators. Discussions meant log-rolling or simple bribery, which Speaker Leary would conduct, and very ably, too, based on his past performance. I think it might be possible, yes. Deirdre didn't bother to repeat that she had already decided against the option. Adele was pleased to deal with someone who assumed that the person she was speaking to could remember a statement made a few seconds earlier. If this matter were publicized, Deirdre went on. It would ruin my chance of getting into the Senate. There's almost no possibility that I would go to jail for treason or even be tried, however. 
I have always expected to enter the Senate at some point, but I can bear the disappointment. Adele looked at her. On the face of it, I can bear the disappointment was sneeringly ironic. But behind Deirdre's polished deadpan, Adele saw a hint that the disappointment would be real. There had been a Leary in the Senate for almost 700 years, and that, if not personal ambition, would hurt Deirdre. Daniel would make a terrible senator. But he might feel that family honor compelled him to fill the seat that his father would vacate, upon death if not by retirement. How would you like to see the problem solved? Adele said. A mechanical voice would have held more emotion. Any solution which doesn't result in the ruin of the Leary family is acceptable, Deirdre said. I'm aware what may be involved in giving an agent of your caliber carte blanche. You think you understand, Adele thought, holding Deirdre's eyes. But perhaps she truly did. The Learys were a notably ruthless family. All right, said Adele. She shut down her data unit and got to her feet. She paused to slip the data unit into her pocket, then said, My help will be expensive. Do you speak for the Leary family or just for yourself? Deirdre cleared her throat. She remained in her chair. I must ask, she said, if your price will affect the physical safety of any member of my family. It will not, said Adele with a smile as hard as the muzzle of the pistol she always carried in the left pocket of her tunic. Deirdre stood and smiled in turn. In that case, she said, I accept your proposition. If my personal resources are insufficient to meet your fee, I will commit those of the Leary family. She walked around the desk and offered her hand. On my word as a Leary, she said. Adele shook Deirdre's hand. I know what the word of a Leary is worth, she said. She opened the door for herself and followed the waiting Tovera through the lobby. I have a good deal of planning to do, Adele thought. But first, I need to speak with Daniel. That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, to Rachel Mintel, and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a shower of coins congealed from the metaphor of Melanti, plus an artificially intelligent soap bar that dies while urging doctors to always wash their hands before surgery, and the thanks and praise of a grateful gathering of star traders and assorted reformed pirates who credit Sharon Lee and Steve Miller with their success, to Sharon Lee and Steve Miller, authors of the latest Leaden Universe series entry, Alliance of Equals. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars.